three more minutes to join us at the innovation stage. We're going to talk about health and how it's how it's increasing so much, how innovation is contributing to health care so much. However, sometimes the focus on the patient is not so evident. In this talk, Karyana is going to show how, uh, how to make that work. You have some nice examples you brought with you. I'm going to talk about them. I see a frog type of, I don't know what it is, but you, you're going to tell us, right? You're going to tell us everything. So please join us at the innovation stage. We'll start at 2. And there are, there are a few seats left. So <laughs> come over. For the people who already found their seats, uh, we placed some uh, power banks on your, uh, on your chairs. They will charge your smartphone for an entire, um, an, an entire battery. So don't throw them away. They're actually valuable, nice kind of gadgets. Yeah. And if your phone is empty, you're good to go in here. So welcome us, join us, I'll welcome you, join um, us at the innovation stage. We're going to start in, uh, in one minute to yeah. be precise. There's also yeah. information yeah. about how you can be an entrepreneur in plants, yeah. and, uh, plants and flowers. That's another topic. We're going to talk about healthcare, innovation in healthcare, and focusing on, 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 on patients because sometimes science really doesn't keep track on how the patient is going to be affected by the innovations. Karianne and... Oh, I forgot your name. Your name? Frank. Frank. Karianne and Frank. Karianne is really Marianne with a K, or... That's how I explain it sometimes. Marianne with a K. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's my name. If everybody has found their seats and found their small power banks, maybe we can start a presentation. Are you ready, uh, Karianne? Yes, I'm ready. Okay take it away okay welcome everybody welcome to the campus party and to this nice innovation stage uh, and I have the honor to uh, entertain you the coming 60 minutes uh, or better I could say I would like to inspire you on innovation and especially uh, on innovation in healthcare and the reason is that in healthcare we have a huge dilemma there are um, well let's say the amount of patients will grow in the future it will grow a lot, the amount, while the amount of care givers will reduce. So we need innovation to be able to face those dilemmas in the healthcare. And I am convinced that technology can play in a very important role in facing all these problems. So that's why I, uh, I'm here and I want to inspire you uh, about the theme patient translation. Because if we talk about healthcare, we talk about patients. And we are looking for science, scientists, technology, and new um, uh, innovations to really help the, the patient healthcare, for, healthcare forward. Well, my name is uh, Marianne with a K. It's uh, Carrie Ann, Karianne, uh, and I'm here together with Frank. Frank is my colleague, Frank Goethals, and we both have a, a, an engineering background. We are both working in a, in a hospital in the, in the center of the Netherlands in Utrecht, in the University Medical Center Utrecht. And we both belong to uh, the initiative which is called Pontus Medical. And I will explain later on what that, what that exactly is. And um, yeah, I would like to have, I will try to have some of what interaction with you. Uh, to be sure that we understand each other and that we can really inspire each other. So Frank will, uh, will help me to get the interaction. Um, yeah, we, we will see. There are some questions uh, all over the presentations where you can react or not, but just what you want yourself. Um, and I think that's the best way to learn about, uh, about innovation. A little bit more about uh, the University Medical Center Utrecht. It's one of the eight uh, academic hospitals in the Netherlands. Um, and as you can see here on this slide, uh, we have many employees. It's a very big organization, more than 11,000 employees. We have 1,000 beds. It's one of the biggest uh, hospitals in the Netherlands. But we also have a lot of students because it's a university medical center. So the, the, the care side is combined with the educational side where people can study for medicine and to be a doctor, become a doctor. And we're also doing a lot of research. We have many researchers in the hospital and uh, we have about 218 PhDs. And what we are focusing on 
is on three things. So the hospital is focusing on patient care. Actually, that's one of the main pillars, maybe the biggest pillar, because we really want to help patients and we want to help the healthcare forward. And how can you help the healthcare forward? You can do it by doing research. So we do a lot of scientific research. We have a lot of researchers in-house and we cooperate a lot with other centers all over Europe. And the third one is education, because you can only uh, educate all those doctors if you really have an edu educational side, so that's also combined in, in the hospital. So now I'm a, a little bit curious about who is here in the, in the audience. Are there any doctors in the audience? Almost. Are there any patients? Maybe all of us, eh? Maybe all of us. Are there any students? Are there any campuseros? Also. So, oh, so we, we, we've got a mix. Are there companies in the audience? And are there other people? The other c category? Yeah, that's what I assumed. That's what I assumed. Okay. Well, I've got a very first question for you. Look. Oh, this is first, first another, another slide. So if you talk about the hospital, we would like to do two things. We want to connect with the patients because healthcare is about patients. And what you see is that healthcare has changed a lot over the years. If you look to the past, the doctor was very, very, very important. And the patients want to be helped by that very important doctor. Nowadays, the doctor still is very, very important. But the distance between the, pa the doctor and the patients has become a little bit smaller. And that means that, and, and that's also necessary if you want to face the problems um, concerning the dilemma I just uh, explained. It is necessary that we cooperate, that the doctors and the patients cooperate, that we have more, um, pay more attention to prevention, for example. We, we don't want to have you into the hospital. Uh, if we can monitor your health, that's even better than uh, coming to the hospital if it's worse. So connection with the patients is very important, um, and we can only have societal impact if we, as patients and the hospital with their doctors, cooperate and translate the patient's needs into new innovative uh, technologies. Here I show you a picture. And maybe Frank, now it's yeah. Frank time. If, if there comes a question, it's Frank time. So it's now Frank it's Frank time. time. If it's Frank time, I will jump off the stage and ask you something to keep you alive and keep you alive. Um, so this question is one of the starter up questions to get you warmed up. What do we actually see on this picture? And I will just go to somebody and ask you, what do you see on this picture? Well, I see a bridge of people on it. And what does it have to do with us? Connecting. <laughs> that was a very good one. <laughs> it was easy. So our name is Pontus. In Latin, we, we uh, build bridges. Um, and as Karjana explained, we are building the bridge between the, the patient, the healthcare professional, uh, what technology can do, and um, we are Pontus in that sense. So. Yeah, that's also an explanation of what Pontus is, because Pontus is a, is a Latin word, which literally means bridge, and uh, that is what Pontus is, uh, is doing. And we are focusing on, on medical technology, so that is where we are really focusing on. And um, we are embedded with this, let's say, method to innovate within the University Medical Center in Utrecht and in the both University Medical Centers in Amsterdam. So you have the AMC and you have the, how do you say, the, the, the VUMC, <laughs> the VMC. And um, we are focusing on medical technology and we want to bring people together. We want to bring, on the other, uh, at the one hand, we want to bring the patients and the healthcare professionals together with, at the other side of the bridge, the companies. All the people that have the knowledge uh, and has the competencies uh, to really create solutions. Because in the hospitals we know what we really need. There is where the clinical need comes from. But to translate that into a viable solution, you really need the organizational knowledge of other companies. And it's, we, we look to the, where we are complementary. And that's also where the scientists come in, because they are right of in the middle, because they are able to do scientific research to really prove what the effect is of a new innovation, but they also are very close to the patient healthcare, so they really know what is needed. So actually, um, we build a bridge over a gap, and that's the gap between the clinics 
and the companies that don't even that, that don't find themselves very easily. And we build a bridge so they can come together. And we do that with a focus to innovate, to really realize innovations. We do that in co-creation because we really believe that within the hospitals we cannot define and realize and develop the product uh, that is needed for the market and that's really helping the healthcare. So we do it in co-creation. And also the, others, the other way around, the companies really like to work together with the hospitals because they have the knowledge and all the clinical background to make it really clinical viable. So we really bring them together in a win-win situation where they both and together can create new solutions. And officially, because we are um, a knowledge institute, we use the term valorization, which means that we really make value out of all the knowledge that we have. So it's also a valorization method. And this is, this is what it looks like. There, there is another very big gap. And we, for innovation, we usually uh, name that the valley of death. And uh, this is one valley of death. Actually, there are many valley of death, but all together it's one big valley of death. And that sounds very pessimistic, um, but we know that if you have an invention, it's not yet an innovation. And what I mean is if you invent something, it's something brilliant, hey, you, have, you have smart brains and you invent something, and maybe you can, you can uh, protect that with a patent, it's not yet an innovation because if it's a patent and it's a, it's a brilliant idea and it stays on the shelf because you cannot bring it a step further to the patient, then the society will not benefit from it. At the moment that the society can benefit from the, from the invention, we talk about innovations. And that's exactly where you need the knowledge of companies for. It's not only because they know how to realize a product and to develop a product, design a product, to produce a product, but also because the companies know how to sell the product to the market. Because only if you are able to sell your invention to the market, people can buy it. Then it has really added value because people want to give money for the solution. And that means that we use the commercialization as a mean to realize our objective, to bring our knowledge and our needs into uh, innovations for the patient. Yeah, this is uh, uh, called the Vesculuminator. It's a product that is designed uh, into the hospital. It's from an idea from the University Medical Center Utrecht. And it was developed by, uh, together with engineers, with designers, and also with a production uh, company. And we over there have a, a real life working uh, product. And what it does is that it shows your veins. So if you go to the hospital and you need to get punctures, punctured because they have to take out some blood of your hand, for example, then my hand, I think you can, you can see it from over there. Here is my vein. It's very easily to touch and to puncture me. But that's not always the case. And what this does, it's, it's brilliant because this is a light. This is infrared light. You put it under your hand. And here is an infrared camera. It's, it's, it sees what you can't see with your eyes, but the infrared camera can see it. And it's projected on the screen. And it's a very good um, additional help for the nurses so they can see where they have to puncture you because now they can see on the, sh on the screen where the vein is. And now I think it's Frank time again. <laughs> <laughs> I felt it coming. So um, this is our picture that we use in our uh, promotional folder. And now the question is why specifically this picture for this kind of product? And I'm looking at you. Can you give me the answer? Well, kids have small veins, so it's harder to uh, actually get a needle in there. Yeah. It's, it's part of the, the answer, I think. Uh, kids have small veins, so it's specifically this group that's very hard to puncture the vein. It's very sad if it doesn't work. But also this kid has a dark skin, so it's extra hard to find the vein. And this is a very cool story how this started. The, the father of this boy, adopted boy, uh, was in the kids' hospital and he saw his kid being punctured four or five times and the kid crying, of course, and everybody said, and the nurse was said, And then he thought, because he was a technical man, this is such a stupid thing and it can be solved so easily with that kind of solution. Um, so it holds for many kids, but especially kids with a bit more fat or a darker skin. This is very useful, a very pragmatic solution. And was yeah. his father also part of building that solution? Sorry? Was he part of building this solution? Was the he actually 
in the project? Yes, he was involved. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, maybe I, you I did a bit of frank action here. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yeah, m maybe it sounds like a kind of coincidence because it was a father of this son, but it's actually that they realized that this patient should not be harmed with these kind of puncturing procedures that are uh, really uh, frightful. And on the other hand, his father was a photonic engineer, so he knew there should, there should be every, somewhere a solution with light, with photonics, to be able to, to show the veins of his son. And that's how it all started. And um, because we worked together with companies and design studios, we finally made a product that is also very useful in the practical situation. Um, and the other good thing is that it is no rocket science to realize this. But uh, the, the key issue is that you have to know what a clinical need is because you can invent everything. But if it's not an answer to a clinical need, it doesn't make any sense. So the, the clinical need was very clear. Um, and yeah, if you can see, it's infrared. It's a light source, it's a, uh, it's a camera, it's a screen. We, ha we had to look in what would was the good combination and if we had enough light and we have to make some special uh, um, things in it. But at the end, within three years, from scratch on, from the clinical need, we had an apparatus that really worked. And so what I want to say is that it's not always that you need very complicated technology to help the healthcare forward. And actually, this is the 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 problem that lies behind that 13 percent of the of the children uh, we we measured at the uh, uh, Wilhelmina children hospital was twice or more punctured in 13 percent of all the cases which is quite a lot and it's traumatic for the patients first of all traumatic for the nurses traumatic for the parents um, and it's not efficient in the process so everyone has a benefit if you can really uh, optimize the situation. So the whole team was really uh, motivated to, to find a solution and uh, we tested that solution in a scientific uh, environment and um, th there was a PhD working on it and she um, concluded that with this new device the missed punctures reduced from 13 to 2 percent. So that makes sense. And this is how it looks like. It's difficult for me to show it here because there's a lot of uh, very uh, uh, bright uh, lighting around, but this is what, what you look, how it looks like. You can see all the veins. And we started with the children because of the little boy, Alexander. But now you see that there are the applications are, of course, wider than that. It's also for adults. And the first question was, if you can puncture the hand, can you also puncture in your arm? And that was for us a little bit more difficult because there are bones around it. But we made a solution specially adapted for that application. And now really the market is demanding for this solution. Another example. It has to do with uh, young children that are uh, incontinent. Of course, that's logic because that's, uh, that's how, how, how it starts in your, in your very young life. But at a certain age, you learn to be continent but 7 million children on the whole world between 7 6 and 12 year olds 12 year old are incontinent and um, you can imagine that those children goes to school go to school and that they have a less quality of life if there is an accident when you are just at school um, so we had contact with uh, dr. Dick he is a pediatric urologist in Utrecht and he said I see all those children and I have I really want to help them so I have a therapy that I learned them to get their reflex back to go to the toilet at time. Because what I see all around here, all those kids, let's say all the students are much older than those target group, but they are really fond of gaming. And that's what happened with those young children. They are gaming all the time. They have to go to the toilet, but they don't want to go to the toilet. And they continue with gaming and gaming. And then at the end, you lose the reflex to go to the toilet in time. And that causes, it's one example of how it can cause, but that's what plays the a lot with the youth is that um, yeah then you, you can get incontinent so the doctor said to us okay I want to have a product a product that can measure um, uh, the, 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 the filling of the bladder and if the bladder is getting filled and you have to go to the toilet but the child doesn't know it because the reflex has lo they ha he has lost the reflex uh, then the, the product gives a signal and the child knows he has to go to the toilet and that's how it works also in the, in the therapy and you learn the child that if you feel you have to go, you have to go to the toilet. 
And um, now we work together in a team. And um, yeah, it, it is an invention in a way, but if you look to the, um, to the industry of boats, they also have to want to measure the depth of the sea where they are in, uh, in floating. And we said, okay, actually that's a little bit of the same. We want to use the same technology as ultrasonic technology to make a kind of depth measurement in the bladder. And if the, if the depth is growing, then at a certain moment you get a signal. And that's what is showed here. So there goes a signal in the bladder. It's an ultras ultrasonic signal. And if it um, passes through the bladder, uh, then, the, the, then it changes, the signal changes, and then it goes through the urine, it's flat, and then it goes to the other side of the wall, and it's, it's, there's, it, it is a bigger signal again. And uh, that's the way, with a kind of depth meter, how you measure the, the filling of the bladder. And this is how it looks like, because the, the doctor said, I have ultimately goal, I want to have a cool gadget for all those kill children, because they like gaming, they are fond of all kinds of gadgets. I want to give them a very cool gadget. Now, finally, this is what we have developed. In the, I think in the first uh, 18 months. So there's electronics inside. It's based on ultrasound and there are a lot of smart components and there's a software module with an algorithm to really detect the filling of the bladder. But now we've got a question for you. Yes. Um, can I hold the prototype? Now the question is to you, if the customer, or the customer, the, the patient and the, the doctor, they claim that they want to have a wearable device, why would we spend 18 months and lots of money and effort building this thing? What's the value actually? I'm going to give it back. I'm going to ask somebody, why is this prototype uh, a sort of a handheld? Did you get the question? <laughs> Did you get the question? Oi. So the question is, why is the prototype a handheld device now? Quite bulky still. Why would we do that? Shall we give the answer? Um, it's very straightforward, actually, because this innovation is a sort of iterative process, and we're building together with uh, partners. So for everybody at each step, we want to say, is, is it good enough to go on? And uh, we need some evidence, actually, to build this decision upon. So you would see in the process that this allows us already to test with the children of Dr. Dick if it actually works. So it's very functional, but it's bulky, ugly maybe. It's not what he's thinking of, but it gives us all the evidence that the first results are that good, that we say, okay, let's continue with our hours, continue with our money. Uh, so that thing for us is actually golden. Uh, it gives us so much insight. Anything to add? Hey, I think it's a very good explanation. And this is a slide that shows a product roadmap because this is where you have to start the doctor has to wish to have a cool gadget this is not a cool gadget but this is the fir very first prototype that helps you to validate at least if you can measure with ultrasonic the, bla the filling of the bladder and that's that's what was the meaning of this device so that's what we developed in 2014 and we are already working on a more miniaturized sample that is uh, that was ready in 2015 and is the basis for what we see that will be ready in 2016. So the end of this year, we will have, that's let's say the first cool gadget because that has the, the size of an iPhone, the iPhone 5, so it's quite a, the, the smallest version. Um, and it's based on, um, uh, on a plaster. So that's the white thing you see below. The plaster go, comes on your, on your skin, on the position of your bladder. And then you click on the iPhone with the ultrasonic measurements uh, uh, technology in it and then it will measure and it's very easy also to click uh, to click it out and to replace it and to to uh, to refill it with energy with the battery but the ultimate goal and that's how we started with that in the in, a, in the in the back of our mind that it really needs to be a plaster with micro and nano technology um, that is really small and that is what you see what we expect and hope to be to have ready in 2020 because then you have a really patient-friendly solution this is a, this is where it starts this is where you do research with this is how you validate it and every time you go a step further what we could have said is okay 
we don't enter any product to the market, we wait until 2020 because then we have the very friendly, user-friendly plaster. But then in, all the, in the meantime, you can't help any patients. So that's the very important reason that we start building prototypes. Um, and also because we have to reduce the risks. So if you... The, the reason that you invent this product is to help children to go to the toilet, to remind them to go to the toilet again, but does this also um, solve the problem that the children don't have the feeling to go to the toilet anymore? Like, um, you're talking about a, s a smaller product, but in the end you want to uh, help the children that they are still going to the toilet again. So. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a device for in a training therapy. So they get a training for a few months, and then after those few months, they have to get, lear to get they learn to get their reflex back. So then they can live without the, the product, without the Eureka bladder monitor, and can do it on their own. And that, that's where we started, but you can imagine that um, it can also be a training device before you are a patient, because now we're talking about patients that really have a problem, but it can also be used as a training device when the children are younger than six years. Um, and we also have another market segment that's very interesting, and that is the, the, the patients, the post-operative patients that go to the operating room, they come back, and then they have to learn to go to the toilet, and as at the moment they can, the catheter can take an out, can take, uh, taken out, and that means that how earlier you can do that, how early the patients can go home. And then we have a third market segment, and that is uh, uh, for elderly people in, uh, in, the, in the nursing uh, houses. And so we have different market groups, but it, it's a good question. It's the, the children don't need to be dependent on this device, but we learn them to train. Yeah. So this is then how it looks like. Um, the University Medical Center has developed this together with Peter Dick, together with his scientists, together with his patients, um, but also together with the company NovioScan. They have the ultrasound technology, and they are the company that really wants to bring the product to the market. And that, of course, is very important, because you don't only want to develop it, now you also want to commercially introduce it to the market so the patient can really benefit from it. Something else. Maybe it's, it's, I think it's not too scary. Normally you don't see those pictures, um, but this is a picture on the operating uh, room. It's, it's what we call open surgery. So if you need to get uh, operated, for example, in your stomach, they make a scarf, they open your belly and they operate. Um, and it's quite good uh, operation method, of course, but the, the wound that you have is quite big and it's um, sensible for infections. Um, so you need to be relatively long at the hospital and you have quite a lot of pain before it's all uh, treated well. So we really thought here patient improvement is needed. So what they uh, invented is what we call minimal invasive surgery or in Dutch sleutelgat operaties. So you don't make a big incision but you make just a minimized hole. You put a camera inside so you can look through the camera into the human body and with two other small holes, you uh, create an opening for the instrument so the doctor can operate. And that's very positive uh, for the patient because you have less wound infections, the wounds are very small, uh, and the hospital stays will be very short, or at least will be shorter than when you have open surgery. Yeah, now a question from us. Um, this innovation is very good for the patient. But then we see uh, less painkillers for the patient, more painkillers for the surgeon. So why would this invention of keyhole operation be more painkillers for the surgeon, actually? Do we know? I'm going to take a walk again. Uh, Madame. Because it's more difficult for them to do so, because they have, like, they have to see everything through the camera. Yeah, and then why does it result in painkillers? is something I can't answer to you. <laughs> but you were very close. Uh, the, so the, you see that the procedure that the surgeon has to do is very different now. So in open surgery, he has more maneuverability, you would say. And in keyhole surgery, laparoscopic surgery, he is using instruments that require certain ergonomic. And mostly ergonomic looks like this. 
that's not very economic at all. Um, and it results, actually, it has been a study that it results in lots of pain and uh, injuries for the surgeon, which is also, of course, if you look at it, if you have a surgeon operating you and he has a neck problem, hernia, it's very dangerous. So you want to avoid this. Um, this kind of invention will be introduced soon by Kariana, and it's a solution for this thing. Yeah, because it's a very good um, procedure in term, from the perspective from the patient. Um, but if you look to the facts and the figures, is that the surgeons have a lot of injuries. So it's physical complaints. 73% of the surgeons that use the laparoscopic surgery method have neck and back pain. And even, it's almost half of the surgeons use painkillers because otherwise they cannot fulfill the time that they are operating, which is a kind of ridiculous. But there is no choice because they have to operate the patient. So they do it. Um, and the other thing is that if you use that technique is that you have a long learning curve. And the reason is that if you um, put an instrument through a hole and you want to move to the right, you, and so the instrument needs to go to the right, your hand goes to the left. So it's all mirrored. And it's something that you can learn, but it's, it's contra-intuitive. So it takes some time to learn it. It's a um, bit like this. <laughs> Difficult. So what they did is that they invented a robot, and I think m most of you have l have heard about it. It's uh, it's uh, it's very uh, smart. It's a robot. It was um, actually um, developed in uh, the United States uh, for the for the military industry, and then they moved that into the hospital because the robot had all kind of advantages that the open surgery had not, and that the laparoscopic uh, surgery method also has not um, and the, I can show a picture of it um, what happens is that the, uh, the, the, the system was designed to make operations possible even when you are the other side are you at the other side of the world or you are in America and you want to operate in Europe it's all possible with the robot because the robot is not in the patient but there is a communication with the, all the instruments close to the patients and then the translation is made. But what happened is that there is hardly any communication because now we, we introduce this into the operating room, but the surgeon is not close to the patient. It's in the corner of the operating room. So there's no communication with all the people around. Um, it's very expensive because it was developed for the, uh, the military industry and not really dedicated for the patient health care in, yeah, in, a, in a situation as, uh, as we're using it now. And a very big disadvantage is that you don't have any force feedback, which means that if you touch an organ with your instrument, you don't feel you don't feel it. So you don't feel if it's hard, you don't feel if it's soft, and you can you can destroy also uh, um, the tissues. And that's even what happened. It's uh, happily uh, very. Um, it doesn't happen a lot, but it, ha it has happened that at the aorta, they, ha they had to put a, a clamp on it, but because they didn't feel if it was already around it and if they were close to the aorta, they really demolished the aorta and the patient died at the operating table. It's a very, very sad uh, example, of course, but the fact that this can happen is, of course, not in favor of the patient's safety. And this was recognized by Dr. Boeke Kruger. He's one of our laparoscopic surgeons in, uh, in Utrecht. And uh, he developed, together with one of our engineers, something completely new. And it looks like this. It is an operating robot, but you are very close to the patients, and you have all the advantages of the, the, the robot uh, surgery has. And uh, the new thing is that you also have force feedback, because here is a demo demonstration model. And um, the surgeon is here, and it can move. So this is the instrument. And you can move it very easily, like, like the normal robot is doing. But the good thing is that it is all mechanically driven. So if you go forward and you touch something which is hard, you can really feel the force. And that is a very, very big ex uh, um, advantage. And this is really dedicated, designed for the operating room and not for the military industry, but really for healthcare into the hospitals as we have right now, which means that it is not that expensive as that the robot is. So that is a very, uh, very big step in, uh, in, in minimally uh, surging techniques. At this moment, it's, uh, it's a, this is a demonstration model. We also have a working prototype, and we are now trying to set up a company 
to really bring it forward to the patient to, by commercializing it. And we did already some tests, so there comes again the connection with the scientific uh, uh, people in the, in the Netherlands and all over the world. And we really made a sample that was used by surgeons. And this is what they say, this feels natural, it's impressive. And this is what you want to hear, because this is what you do it for. Finally, you do it for the patient, but you also do it for the surgeon to make his work a little bit easier and really to improve all the things that has to do with patient safety. I think I lost some text, but um, it really, this is where we do it for. It improves patient safety and health. And here you see again the name of a company because the hospital and the doctors and the designers couldn't do it on their own. So they did it together with INDES, which is an industrial design engineering uh, company in the Netherlands. And they really helped to build this. And um, yeah, we look forward to, uh, to work with them on the next uh, surgical instruments. Yeah, maybe I'm going to ask the question to you because, Karyala, because you mentioned this um, meme as it is called, and we are at the innovation stage, what would you say? What is better, low-tech or high-tech innovations? Yeah, that, that is the question. And what we saw for the operation, operating robot, it's really high-tech. No one had built that before, and there are just a few, comp few hospitals around the world that can really use it, and it's really high-tech, but that's not what we really want to reach. We want to reach that all of the hospitals in the, in the world can make use of robots. So in my terms, this is much more low-tech but it is really um, fulfilling the wishes of the surgeons. So in my opinion, high-tech is not always better. If you can do it with low-tech, please do it with low-tech. If you can offer a solution within three years for the patients, please go for that and don't go for the high-tech, which is maybe much more smarter and maybe at the end much more uh, less expensive. But if we have to wait for that for 10 years, then we are too late. So my opinion should be go for low-tech. Can I ask you a question? Of course. I was thinking about how um, um, pilots do not know how to land a plane anymore because the plane will do it itself, right? Will this also risk that surgeons don't have the skills anymore to, to operate on patients when robots take over? Yeah, the, the, robots does, the robot does not take over the work of the surgeon because the surgeon is, is, is steering it. Right? He, he is behind the steering wheel because he is behind the operating robot. And because of the force feedback, you really have the contact with, uh, with the tissue and with the human body inside. The only difference is that, that you don't have all the physical and the mental complaints as they have right now. Yeah. Improving both patient and surgeon. That's nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Another case, it's called the Whistler. Um, did you know that 50% of young children with lung function problems, and then I mean lung function problems like you and I have, when you have catch the cold and you cough or you wheeze, um, that 50% of the children, if they go to the general practitioner, they receive unnecessary medication. I didn't know before I came into contact with uh, Dr. Van der Ent, who is a uh, pediatric pulmonologist in, uh, in Utrecht and he explained that to me and he said I want to change the world. I have done 10 years of scientific research with what we call the refrigerator. It's a measuring devi device as, as large as a refrigerator is and he said I have measured uh, in a new way all the lung function of, ten, of thousands of uh, young people, of young children and everyone said that I couldn't do it but I did it. Uh, I had to build a refrigerator, but I did it, and I have um, captured all those data, and I uh, measured those children six years later when they could be measured with uh, uh, the, the common technology. Maybe you all know the spirometry. Yeah? If you go to the doctor and you have lung function problems, you have to, to blow uh, for a certain time and with a certain force, and young children cannot do that because they cannot follow those instructions. So that's why I built this refrigerator. Um, because he said if all those children, those 50%, get the wrong medication because it doesn't help or they get medication that they don't need, then that will have a negative effect on the quality of life because the children that really have asthma don't get treated in the best way. And that, and that is, of course, very costly. 
Um, so he said, please do something with my relevant data set. And he said, I want you, you are an innovation manager, I want you to recreate my refrigerator into a foolproof handheld device. And I said, okay, that's an interesting challenge. So what we did is that we built a bridge. We built a bridge from his patients and his clinicians to the organizations outside the hospital. And we found two other organizations. And we all ha had our uh, specific um, uh, knowledge. So the hospital had, of course, the healthcare knowledge, but uh, CCM, it's a center for concept and megatronics. They had the ultim ultimately technology knowledge. And we found WellDesign, which is a design agency uh, company in Utrecht, by the way. And they knew everything about product development, about usability and about producibility. And we together, in a, in an, in, in a cooperation, we created the Whistler. And that is, um, could only have been created because we did it together. Because none of us could have invented the Whistler. And this is the Whistler. So the refrigerator now is a handheld full apparatus. That's what he wished. And that's what we did. It took us five years, so it was a little bit longer as we expected. Um, but the reason that it takes so long is, of course, because no one else has invented it before, because it takes five years to invent it. Um, so that's, that's really what you do by building a bridge, bringing those people together and create a solution uh, that none of them could have invented themselves. And what we did in one afternoon, so we invited Dr. Van der Ent, he said, okay, what do you want? Yeah, I want to reduce the size of the refrigerator. Okay, okay, we understand. And then he left and we brainstormed for one afternoon. And at the end of the afternoon, we made a sketch and you won't believe it, but it looked like this. So there was a designer and there was a group of people and he said, what we need to do is that if you want to measure the very young children, so the babies, then you want to have a device that has the, uh, the, the, the annotation of giving a child the bottle. Uh, like you have a child here and you give, so it needs to be very easy to hold in your hand. Please, only one knob, one button. So the, the product has one button. Uh, and then you need to, then you have to measure the, the long function. So that was very easily uh, invented in one afternoon. And then it took five years to get all the technology insights together um, to really create this product. Kayana, what's the main challenge that takes five years? What's the, the most the main, important? Yeah, the main challenge was that what, what we found very fast is that we uh, used, uh, wanted to use the ultrasonic technology to measure the very small flow of the, the, the breath of the babies, um, but to get that really uh, reliable was very difficult because there were all kinds of temperature effects, all kinds of effects that no one could have foreseen before uh, that, we, uh, yeah, that we, we came by. But the other thing, yeah, yeah, here you can see it all a little bit. Eh? So you start with building a prototype. It's the prototype like this. So you use standard casings, you, st you use standard uh, uh, components and then you have a square ugly apparatus but then you can test at least the ergonomics you can test the first uh, technology uh, results and then you really redesign it to what you want what you made on the first sketch um, but now I, I've got a question because that's another reason why it took so long on this picture you see that there is a green uh, green back part of the product and now the question for you is, there is also a, a, a blue, or actually it's a purple module. Why do you think that we have two modules? I will go into the zaal. Jongen dame. Why is there a, a green and a blue housing for this product? Why would it be? I don't know, maybe the interaction with the babies or the children? Some babies like green, some babies like blue. <laughs> uh, Marianne? I really don't know. I don't know. My guess. <laughs> Appealing colors, maybe. User preferences. No, it's a bit, it's a bit different. Um, what we always try to do is if we start an innovation, and uh, in this case, Dr. van der End came to us, and he provides us with a case. For my patients, this is very valid. Then we try to see how big can we get this case. So if this application can also benefit other patients, we try to make this um, impact area as big as possible. And that's actually why we developed the same product, but it has two different modules, a blue one for a different patient group and the green one for a different patient group. 
So the product actually becomes two applications. And that's also why the development took a little bit longer because we designed the product to be like this and then we realized that the general practitioner where all those children come to at the first sight didn't want to buy a uh, a, let's say a spirometer dedicated for children because they said okay I understand why a pediatrician wants to have this module because he only sees children but I see people from 0 to 100 years old why should I buy for that specific group such a device I said okay okay maybe we can help you if you make a device that is also able to measure all your adult patients are you happy with that I said, yeah I'm happy with that I said, okay okay yeah, yeah. we had to go for that strategy because otherwise the business model was too thin we couldn't get enough sales only for the pediatricians. So we want to have all the general practitioners to buy the Whistler. So we redesigned the product and we said, okay, if you take out this one, which is, ded is dedicated, developed for the young children and the babies, and replace it by the blue one, and with the blue one you can measure all your adults, then you must be happy. And that's what exactly happened. But then we had to develop two products instead of one. So that's why it took a little bit longer as we expected. But it was really necessary, because otherwise the general practitioner shouldn't buy it. And if they shouldn't buy it, we could have never find a commercial party that really wants to step in and do the further investments for the commercialization. So that's uh, always very important in all the innovations that we face. If the invention is that bright, the scientific base is very good. If there is not a good viable business case, then it will not fly anyway. So this is uh, how it looks like. So we developed it for the young babies and the children, and we added the, the other components for the adults. And then finally we found a company, which is called Medi Spirit, and they said, okay, we believe in it, and we will bring it a step further, and we will introduce it on the market. And that is finally uh, a very happy end, of course, of all our uh, innovation strategies. If there is a company that really makes brochures and goes to all the hospitals and said, well, there is a brilliant product that really can help your patients forward, and can you, what, do you want to buy it? Because at that moment, the, the innovation is implemented and the healthcare is really having benefits from it. And you can say that then the circle is closing. So it started with the refrigerator. That is, let's say, the demonstrator where, the, where the, the doctor did all his scientific research with. He collected all the data and he said, now I have something that is really helpful for the, for the daily practice. And, oh, sorry. And with that, with that innovation, with that device, it's also possible to, de to do further research. So the doctor is not only happy because he can help his patients, he is also happy because, of pedi because the general practitioners can help the patients, which means that he only gets the very, very sick patients, so he can be more focused on the patient group that he is really uh, interested in. And on the other side, he has a device where he can do much more research with. It was very difficult to, to, to work with the refrigerator, but he could because he had some very smart researchers that really learned to work with it. But if you have a very simple product, then it's not only one smart researcher that can work with it, but then you have 100 of smart researchers that can work with it. And that means that you can collect even more data and that you can even learn more about asthma or other lung function diseases in the world. Yeah, I think it's, uh, we are coming to the end. Yeah, we had uh, one philosophical question in the program. <laughs> but I think from your story, Kayan, it's already very clear what we see as innovation. We answered some of the questions. So maybe it's nice to continue to the next one. Yeah, for me, innovation is really that you, that you start with the customer insight and that you really think from the perspective of the patient, that you make a patient journey. The patient is at home, it is feeling sick, it goes to the doctor, it goes to the hospital, it comes in the hospital, it comes to a reception, and then it comes to the polyclinics, and then it comes... That you really follow all those steps because there are many optimizations possible, not only in the process, but also in supporting technology that can help to maybe erase some of those process steps or that some process steps can be... Uh, replaced at home or can be re replaced to another situation and I think that is the really basic of, uh, of innovation so it starts with the doctor it starts with the patient innovation in my perspective is co-creation we have shown uh, a few samples a few examples where you could have seen that that really worked and uh, yeah at the end innovation is also about commercialization so some people think it's it's a word you don't uh, you don't you shouldn't use 
specifically when you're oriented in scientific research. Eh? If you work together with the industry, it's, it's not done. But I think it's the best way to do. Because if you can make the bridge, then you really get the, the, the bright ideas implemented. So I am convinced that we can have societal impact with all the scientific knowledge uh, and, and technology knowledge if we start with the clinical need. So I think that's the end. Thanks maybe for your attention. Some, maybe some con comments on that. Can we, can we maybe discuss that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Yeah? Any comments on, um, on innovation and how it needs to be perceived? Or maybe another question or something else you want to comment upon? Because I'm really not afraid of the commercialization because true innovation solve a problem, right? So there must be a demand for it. Yeah, for sure. Therefore, yeah. Com commercialization the is not. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's the best check. Um, well, yesterday there was in the news that um, that regulations need to be adapted because many uh, medical devices are not uh, are not, yeah not not good enough. Um, and also, um, well, uh, high-tech and also low-tech products don't really uh, get integrated into the medical system. Uh, why do you think that is? That the quality that is not good enough? So, so the last, said you, the high-tech and the low-tech is not implemented? Yeah, well, the, the innovations uh, don't, don't really make it into, this in, into the medical system. Okay. And um, yeah. many of them. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I recognize what you're saying um, because Having the invention is one, creating the solution is, is the second step, finding a commercial party is the third step, and then comes the very, no, it, it's, I think it's the, fir the fourth step, it's a very big hurdle to get it really implemented. Because you have the insurance companies uh, that really have to see the benefits of, for example, such a, a robot, uh, because they have to, maybe it's a little bit uh, more expensive or maybe it's cheaper, but they have to give a kind of code that the hospital can sign his, uh, 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 his fees on. And if they are not convinced, then they will not finance it. And you can only get it financed if you really have proven that it has uh, a positive effect on the health economics, which means that it has a patient benefit and that it has, is cost effective. And um, let's say doing that, you need a health technology assessment, which is a scientific approach. So it takes you months, maybe years, to come in that stage. And then the other side, so that's the, the, the insurance, uh, the financing part of innovation. The second one is that you have many stakeholders in the, in the healthcare. So you have the patient that maybe really wants a solution. You have the surgeon that wants it. But then you have the purchase department of the hospital. Now you have, you have to convince them. Um, and then secondly, uh, you have maybe the insurance companies. Uh, you have all kinds of stakeholders all around the innovation. And it doesn't matter if it's close to the innovation or it's far away. If one of them is not in favor of the innovation, then it will not be a success. And what we have learned from that is that we bring that back very early in the whole innovation stage. So we start with uh, connecting with all the stakeholders that we can define very early and define if it, it's, it's a tricky innovation or not. And it's a tricky innovation if there is somewhere a stakeholder that can say no. So you have developed it for five years, and then there's one state to no. I, I, I thought it was the right solution, but now I say no. So that's difficult. Answer to your question? Thanks. Mm. Any other questions or comments, maybe? OK. There's one more question. Final question. So my name is Jurgen Sandig, CEO of Cypher. Um, we see a lot of um, things happening in medical imaging and uh, automatic analysis there. Um, I can imagine that um, radiologists might be reluctant uh, accepting this uh, new technology because they apparently lose their jobs or um, the position is uh, undermined. So in your stakeholder analysis, how do you envision such technology how to enter this market because if all need to say yes then some important things might not uh, land or be a commercial success yeah is it a specific question about uh, radiologists or you mean more general <laughs> more general in such uh, innovation because some innovation might really disrupt uh, the current yeah. system yeah 
Yeah, that, that is al always a risk. But I think what you need to do is in your marketing strategy is find the key opinion leaders. So for example, Dr. van der Ent is one of the key opinion leader or ambassador of this device. So he will do research with his colleagues in that field. They get interested and they get this used. And then step by step, you roll out the product. But sometimes it goes very slowly because it has a negative effect on the things that they were doing before. Or if there is not an insurance company that is really changing the model, then maybe they um, are still, let's say it politically, that uh, an old-fashioned intervention is um, more financially incentive for them than a new, than a new device because the, the reimbursement is not uh, organized well. So there are all kinds of things that can play a role in, uh, in, in hindering the implementation. Do you think that is the most optimal way of uh, implementing new uh, technology of uh, drive innovation? Because th there are gatekeepers who might be reluctant in um, accepting new technology because they l apparently lose their position or jobs, uh, which might save a lot of money. And um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, th th but, but then, then you can, uh, yeah, we have some uh, innovations that are really uh, have a cost, a very big cost effect because you, you save some labor. And that means exactly that people don't want to accept that innovation because then they can lose their job. But then you need to scale it a little bit higher because we're talking about societal impact and we are not talking about the very individual position of a person in a hospital. But it's difficult. There are forces that sometimes are not really influenceable. And I don't know how to solve that. Um, but <laughs> th th that's one of the difficulties uh, in, in innovation, in innovating in healthcare. But I think that, for example, the, the insurance companies can play an, a, a very important role in that. They can stimulate innovations at the moment that they see that it has a financial impact, so it has an Im a societal impact. So we really need to, to work more closely together. Uh. And I think you opened with the statement, I'm sorry, that. Uh, patients and doctors are, are mostly at stake, right? I wanted to add that maybe sometimes we also bring in the patient's experience into the process and we now see that in the, our hospital and also in the sector um, and that for the doctors the patient's voice is very important. So sometimes it will be the patient in the future claiming a, an innovation that's not the best for the doctor's job but best for the, for the sector and that's a very interesting thing. Thank you very much for, um, well, tons of nice, beautiful innovations. We still don't know what the frog is especially designed for. Uh, yeah, you want to know and what I'm the so frog curious. is about. Yes, we have five minutes for to clear the stage for the next speaker. Yeah. Yeah? And, uh, well, I think at one of the very early pictures you could have seen it. But <laughs> the funny thing is that when the father with the, 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 the dark-skinned child was thinking about how can I use light uh, into the illuminated into the hand in a way that is it's patient friendly. And then he knew that children like to play with, uh, with frogs, but like to play with toys. So he went to the, to the toy store and he bought some of different sizes of frogs. He built in the light and uh, then he added uh, then it's not frightening for the child anymore. And he said, okay, please, here's this frog. It's a nice frog, you can hold it. And then the child hold it and then the lights go through his hand. So it was a helpful thing to, uh, um, to get the product used. But at the end, the, the illumination strength of the LED, of the infrared LED, was not strong enough to go through the frog and then through the hand. So we had to throw away the frog. But we, had some, we made some pictures in the very first beginning. So everyone is talking about the frog. But it's still a product like that. But it's still uh, annotated with the frog. But that's the story behind that. Thank you for clearing yeah. that up. <laughs> that's really great. Okay, so thanks again for a nice, inspiring speech. Maybe uh, people can talk to you after at the, in the speakers cafe or somewhere else that yeah. you can be found during yeah, the. We are, we are still party. around, and uh, within two weeks we have our yearly Pontus Medical expert meeting. So if you are interested in, 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 in making connections with people in the hospital or with people in the in companies, if you have a bright idea. Please look at the website. It's expert meeting, um, Pontus Medical Expert Meeting NL. Thank you very much. Thank you, audience, for your attention. And please find them at the Speakers Cafe. Give them a big hand. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>